my word is Huguenot, and you spell it H-U-G-U-E-N-O-T. Okay, well, a Huguenot is a French Protestant. We use it for the French Protestants um, in the period 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. It's quite historically specific. And it has a clear starting point because it's in the 16th century that you have Luther making his protest, protesting against all the abuses of the Catholic Church. Up to that point, you know, Europe is Catholic. You have Luther making his grand protest and, in a sense, kicking off Protestantism. And so Protestantism comes to France as this barbaric, outside heresy from the north, from Germany, and then from Switzerland, from Calvinist Geneva, because Calvin is, I guess, the most famous after Luther in terms of developing Protestantism. It's difficult to know what the origin of the term was, and people speculate on it, and I guess the most common speculation it comes from a man called Hugh, uh, who was a, a, a well-known Calvinist in Geneva. There are also kind of quite different speculations, so we don't really know. It's unusual in terms of a word that travels over to English in that it sounded already in French when it was coined in the 16th century. It sounded like a foreign, um, strange, made-up, invented word. And with those kinds of words, there's often a sort of strong, effective charge. Not necessarily negative, but it can be negative, and it was in, in this case, I think, because um, Protestants weren't popular in Catholic France. They were persecuted, so Huguenot originally was, was not a positive term. But I think it quickly became um, a kind of neutral term, if you like, to describe French Protestants and a term um, that was used outside France as well as Protestants who were um, persecuted decided to leave France and go to more sympathetic environments in neighbouring countries, whether it's Germany, Switzerland, or um, often to England. England um, was a kind of major host for these Huguenots. Um, some went to the States, to America, um, and some even got as far as South Africa. It was used in English at the time because of the Protestants coming over, um, taking refuge, and the word refugee comes at the same time. And I think it survived, although it's a historical phenomenon, um, people are still interested in the Huguenots, partly you know, because people like to trace their ancestry, for instance. You might get Americans who are interested in looking back genealogically and tracing their, their path back to to Huguenots. Well, they were leaving France throughout the 16th century, which is the period of the wars of religion, so where, you know, um, Protestants are being assassinated, murdered, they're, they're, there's war. At the end of the 16th century, you have something called the Edict of Nantes, um, which is the end of the wars of religion. Um, and that sets out a framework for religious toleration. So you then have almost a century um, of a degree of religious toleration. And then in 1685, the Sun King, Louis XIV, um, revokes the Edict of Nantes. And this is a kind of famous date in French history, 1685, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And that's a terrible day for French Protestants, and it kind of removes their, um, their freedoms, uh, their freedom to worship in, in these particular places. Um, so then you get a real um, flood of refugees going to England and and other Protestant nations. I should say a little bit perhaps about what about their reception in England. Um, and there are sort of two levels to that, I guess, that on the one hand, if you're looking at um, the hierarchy, the, the nobility, the, the king, um, there's, there is a sort of hospitable reception of, of French Protestants, because on the whole, they're people like us. They're almost wasps. They are white uh, Protestants and um, they were perceived as hard-working and they brought with them all sorts of um, skills and tricks of the trade and so on. A lot of them were weavers, textile workers, um, lace makers and, and so on. They were perceived as good refugees, the sort you might want to welcome in on the whole. And the person I'm interested in, uh, Jean Chardin, was ennobled by Charles II, for example. He becomes Sir John Jardin and he's very welcome because he's a diamond trader and um, can give all sorts of uh, information to fellow merchants about how to do trade with the East, with the Orient, with Persia and so on. But of course British weavers weren't necessarily very keen on the competition because they thought this is an influx of, of um, 
of competition and it means that prices are going to go down and that wages are going to go down and price of foodstuffs and so on is going to go up. And, um, you know, they were very worried about that and worried that the French, and this is where they're not quite wasps, they're not Anglo-Saxon, they're French, these French had their kind of sophisticated secrets and so on and would produce um, the kind of embroidery and so on that um, British workers found very difficult to produce. So they, they were not universally welcome. I think there may be um, a certain romanticisation or a kind of sanitisation of the history of the reception of Huguenots in, in England um, and probably in America, although I don't really know very much about that. But we talk about the Huguenots um, as if that was a, probably a glorious chapter in English history because we welcomed our co-religionists in a very sympathetic way and we provided, provided this safe haven or refuge from the kind of evils of Catholic Europe. Um, and I think we forget about the fact that the Huguenots were not universally welcome and that there was a sort of much more complicated situation in the... 17th and 18th centuries. As far as France is concerned, as I said, it's a sort of a historically specific phenomenon and you don't hear much about Huguenots as such after 1789, after the French Revolution. And that's really because having had a Catholic state, once you have the French Revolution, by and large, you have a secular state and that's a huge shift and of course very unusual for um, Europe of the time to shift to a secular state and that's um, true down to today that France is incredibly proud of its secular tradition.